This meeting is being recorded. Good morning, everyone, um, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Aisha Dixon. I'm the director of the Ameritai Retiree Relations Center here at UCLA, and we're so glad to always collaborate with our partners at the Ameritai Association and the Retiree Association. So today we have um, Michael Heafy, who is the program chair for um, the Retiree Association. And uh, we are recording this Zoom. So if you have to leave or take a bio break, please feel free to do that. We'll be posting this on our YouTube channel later. Uh, there's also a closed captioning feature that you can turn off if you don't wanna see the lines at the bottom, but to be more accessible to our retirees, we do include that. Um, currently everyone is, un is muted. You will not be able to unmute yourself until we open it up for Q&A. Um, there's been times of random dog barking or gardeners or helicopters. So to give our speaker the full attention, everyone is muted. So without further ado, Michael Heapy. <laughs> Many thanks, Aisha. Um, I wanna thank uh, Nancy Barrett, my cohort in this, uh, for all her email work in lining up Mr. Bellot Garza, who will be our guide today at the Vende Museum of the Cold War. So all you baby boomers out there, prepare for a walk back in history. Michael, please take it away. I will, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, I really appreciate y'all uh, welcoming me uh, into your program. It's always exciting when we can uh, do outreach to various organizations and, and especially introduce people uh, who have never been to the museum or have never heard of us uh, to a bit of what we do and, and what we have uh, within our walls. So um, I'll give a brief introduction to the museum and then I'll, I'll be uh, sharing my screen uh, and we'll be able to navigate uh, the entire museum grounds and, and I'll walk through a, a few of our exhibitions we have on display as well. Uh, so the Venda Museum is a Historical Archive and Art Museum of Former Communist Countries during the time period of the Cold War. So uh, more or less that time period is defined by the years of 1949 to 1991. Um, and the museum's collection has over 150,000 total objects uh, sourcing from all various uh, former communist countries during the time period. Uh, it does have a heavy emphasis on places like uh, the Soviet Union and East Germany, uh, but also encompasses all the Eastern Bloc countries and other places in the communist sphere of influence during the 20th century. Uh, so focusing on places like China, Vietnam, uh, and Cuba as well. Um, and you may be seeing uh, some of that in the exhibition. And, and really the museum uh, can't be neatly put into one easily defined box. You know, we are, I would say probably more so we are, would define ourselves as an art museum, uh, you know, and with not only art from these former communist countries during the time period, but also bringing contemporary artists, uh, many of whom are uh, from these same, very same countries, uh, but also, uh, you know, uh, local artists as well, all, and we combine or really activate our historical collection in an interesting way where we bring in this contemporary art uh, to really continue on the conversation about this time period and bring that into the present as well. Cause uh, you know, I always say, you know, especially younger people, myself, I was born in 1992. So I was born just after the Cold War time period. And I think a lot of people my age and younger, we really look to that time period as, as history or, you know, as the very distant past. But obviously for, for, you know, probably for many of you, you know, it's not viewed as history. It was just, you know, that was just life at the time. And, and what's really interesting is, you know, we get to present a perspective of what life was like for people uh, lived in these communist countries at the time, which was really an experience that wasn't really known to the outside world at the time, oftentimes by design. Uh, you know, these were very uh, insular countries, you know, many of them under authoritarian governments and, you know, with so much, uh, you know, distortions of information or limitations to what people had access to inside these countries. And, and again, that visibility from the outside in uh, I think it's a really interesting experience for many of our visitors to come in and to really learn a lot of things about what everyday life was like in these countries uh, that they might have otherwise had very little understanding of. And, and especially, uh, you know, viewing history through the lens of, you know, art from these various countries, each of which had very unique 
artistic circumstances, at times very restrictive artistic circumstances, uh, but also the, the museum heavily emphasizes material culture. So just objects of everyday life, you know, things that were produced in these countries that after the Cold War time period were largely thrown away or packed into storage. You know, people didn't want to carry those things on into this new new uh, new life they were living after you know the fall of state socialism in these countries in the you know in the 1990s so uh, it's really uh, an archive uh, a time capsule in that way too uh, so I hope to introduce you to some uh, new concepts some maybe some different styles of art some unexpected things um, and yeah with that maybe I'll just jump in because I, I can use a lot of what we have on display uh, it's really as a launching point for that larger discussion, but I'll definitely make sure to leave some time uh, towards the end to, you know, open it up for q and I'm always really interested in what people's uh, perspectives are on what we're showing it here at the museum. Uh, I think uh, a lot of it might be particularly interesting to you. Uh, so this is our building. Uh, this, this is kind of part of the museum story itself in that uh, this building is a former National Guard armory. Uh, that was constructed in Culver City in 1949 as a part of the larger Veterans Park project, uh, which was built to commemorate World War II veterans in that uh, post-war period. So uh, what's fascinating about this building is that the National Guard actually occupied it from 1949 till the, I think, the mid-2000s, in which they, they abandoned the building. And then uh, we, uh, prior, the museum itself has been around for about 20 years, uh, but uh, we only moved into this building about five years ago. Uh, so uh, in this deal with Culver City, they more or less lease the building to us for a $1 a year. Um, and the agreement is that uh, in that agreement, we, uh, you know, we have free admission at all times. We're open on, to the public on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. Totally free admission, uh, not only to view the exhibitions, but for our public programs. Uh, we do a lot, large variety of programs, uh, you know, theater performance, music performance, uh, live discussion series you know, uh, author interviews, uh, all of those things, we never ever charge for a program. And we really try to act not only as a research center uh, to study the objects at the museum, uh, but also just a place to open our doors to the public and really to educate them on this, you know, this very specific time period that oftentimes not a lot of people have a lot of general understanding of. Um, so we're going to be taking uh, a closer look at some of our exhibitions, uh, our two exhibitions, uh, which is going to be uh, questionable history and Soviet Jewish life. Um, and I'll be covering those probably in about a 40 minute period. Um, I do just wanna show a bit of our lobby space here. Uh, the way we're set up is we have uh, these side hallways where we store uh, some of our collection. Uh, you can see up here, we have these open storage shelves where up here, some of our collection is sorted by materials. So you can see like domestic product, musical instrument, liquid, plastic, ivory for example, and then over on our side hallways here, we exhibit some of our larger, more significant collections. Uh, just to give a sampling of the types of objects we have in the archive, like I said, we have over 150,000 total objects in the museum. So actually no more than probably 5% of it is actually on site at the museum. We have a offsite storage space that is more or less maxed out at this point uh, in East Los Angeles. And, and uh, we rotate out both our permanent collection and then uh, objects for our exhibitions as well. Uh, but that's a bit of a sampling of the permanent collection. I'll also share the link for the same virtual tour after I'm done speaking. So you all can pull that up on your browser and you can explore uh, the museum in full on your own afterwards if you're interested. Uh, I also want to show this bus is actually is technically a part of the exhibition, but it also is a bit of our, our mascot for the museum. And I think it's representative of kind of the swath of material culture and objects that we collect here at the museum and we exhibit and use as education pieces. Uh, this is of course a bust of Vladimir Lenin, who was, you know, as we'll see in this exhibition too, was one of the most monumentalized figures across the Eastern Bloc, not only in the Soviet Union, uh, but in other uh, communist countries at the time. Of course, you know, the art forms of many of these countries was an emphasis on creating ideological art, uh, much of it either exalting, you know, figures like labor heroes or the collective worker state, but oftentimes also very much looking to the past and celebrating communist icons like Karl Marx or, you know, in this case, Vladimir Lenin. Uh, this one in particular was actually produced in East Germany. Um, uh, so this was an East German bust of Vladimir Lenin. Uh, but as you can see, this is 
this one has been sort of defaced from its original production. So I think this one is uh, important to emphasize because while the museum does have a lot of art that falls under the umbrella of official art, so, you know, state approved art, uh, again, that oftentimes was tying back to the ideology. This in its original form was very much, you know, an official bust, you know, a state produced bust. Uh, but this one in particular was actually defaced uh, in uh, spring of 1989. Um, in uh, the Leipzig demonstrations in East Germany that were sort of these precursors to the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. So uh, it was part of this larger network of largely peaceful protests in East Germany that was really putting pressure on the regime to allow free exit from the country and free freedom of movement uh, across Europe. And, and this one in particular, again, was defaced in these protests. So, you know, in addition to having lots of examples of official art, the museum also has a lot of works that fall under the umbrella of either unofficial art or, or even more so dissident political action art as well. And a lot of that is through the defacing of official portraits. And we'll see some of those in the show too. But, you know, in this defacing, they, they gave Lenin this makeover with this very bright kind of like pop art, uh, pink and blue, uh, in this way. So in a way, it's sort of satirizing the seriousness of the legacy of Lenin. And again, we'll see some of that uh, in this show too. Uh, but I, you know, in saying that, you'll see some examples, some that fall very easily under the official art umbrella, some that more easily fall under the unofficial umbrella. And then really in the study of the art, there's there's actually a lot of circumstances that things can't be so easily defined as official or unofficial. And there's actually a lot of gray zone. Uh, and that's a lot of what we explore at the museum is more the nuances of the art. Of course, a lot of this art was produced as propaganda and used as propaganda in these societies, but there's also a lot of not so clearly defined examples. And there's also some that just excel artistically, uh, despite being, you know, at least in my opinion, that excel beyond just being written off as, as propaganda as a whole. Uh, so uh, this show is very uh, kind of nuanced and complex, and it's way more than I can cover in a brief tour. So, uh, I'll just give uh, sort of the most basic breakdown of the, the message of the show and maybe highlight some key works uh, that are in it. Uh, so this show is called Questionable History. Uh, this is uh, kind of an experimental show that plays with the idea of information itself as it's presented in curatorial settings and, and really, you know, playing with this idea that, you know, historians, the same as museum curators, uh, sometimes they're faced with situations where they have to, you know, work with limited sets of information and, and sometimes make the decision as to, you know, what is, you know, what is subjective inference and, and what is objective fact. And, and really, you know, when dealing with the study of, of objects from former communist countries, of, of course, truth was a relative term and truth was something that was often mobilized as you know, as as this you know weapon for for you know propagandistic messaging. So you know, especially with a museum like us, who largely deals with objects from former communist countries, there's there's really a lot of gray zones in the interpretations of these works. Um, and again, you know, in that set of uh, you know uh, identity of certain artworks as official and unofficial, sometimes it's not so easy to understand what an individual artist's messaging in a work is if we don't know what their ideological uh, identity was at times. And, you know, sometimes we don't know if some things are uh, satirical. Of course, places like, you know, Russians, former Soviets oftentimes use satire or sense of humor in a lot of their art. You know, sometimes it's, it's not so clear if, if things are being serious or some things are being, uh, you know, presented with more satire. Uh, so, uh, this was actually a five-part exhibition, so it's uh, broken into five distinct zones, each of them uh, experimenting with the presentation of information, specifically the curatorial presentation of information, um, and really manipulating the way that that information is presented, and in turn challenging the viewer to, you know, uh, assess their own interpretation of the art and accordingly the history that's shared with it. Um, you know, by the way that the, that the information itself is shared to the viewer. Uh, so in this first section, this is called Deconstructing Lenin. Uh, so very clearly, these are all presenting artworks, uh, some of them official, some of them unofficial, uh, that deal with the figure of Vladimir Lenin, who, you know, especially, you know, in the 19, 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, 
you know, was someone who was revered as a saint-like figure and accordingly had all these monuments and artworks, you know, made with this figure. But, you know, as you get to the 1970s and the 1980s and there, as more growing discontent with the system and, and really the failings of these uh, utopian visions in the Soviet Union uh, that, you know, artists especially were starting to present with maybe more of a critical eye uh, or, you know, maybe with less of a, a, a holy uh, disposition towards the legacy of Lenin as well. So uh, this is presenting Lenin in all different types of perspectives uh, through art. Uh, this is a work from the late Soviet period. This is also the one that gives the section its name, Deconstructing Lenin. So uh, this is a work uh, that was put together in 1991 by uh, an artist who was part of a larger collective of Soviet street artists who were using the visual language of Soviet propaganda, but using it to be critical of Soviet history or or their present circumstances in the uh, 1990s. So uh, this is one where this idea of the legacy of Lenin that it can, you know, at the same time, some people were being more critical and, and were being more honest about, say, like, you know, the mass murders and the purges that of the Lenin regime. But also at the same time, there was some rehabilitation and some uh, you know, leaning on Lenin as sort of this father, fatherly figure, which is what the propaganda at the time was really building Lenin up as, as this, you know, very familiar figure, someone you could trust, someone, you know, young people loved, and this was, you know, someone we want to look up to in society. And at the same time, people, especially who are maybe more sympathetic to the Soviet system, uh, you know, were in the business of rehabilitating uh, his legacy at the same time. Uh, there's really so much to go into. So again, I'm just going to pick a couple of works I find really interesting. Uh, this is a uh, this is a work uh, from 1972 from Hungary, uh, and it was put together by an artist named Tibor Zala, uh, who was in he actually was the headmaster of the Bud Budapest School of Arts in the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, he found quite a bit of acclaim in that period of the 1970s and beyond in graphic art. Uh, he has a lot of really stunning movie posters uh, he put together in Poland and he found a, a quite a bit of acclaim with that. Uh, this one's really interesting. Uh, he has a couple of works kind of in the same style where, you know, he's he has an element of, you know, what you think of with communist art, which is, you know, he's portraying uh, this very classic uh, image of Vladimir Lenin. Uh, but what's fascinating about this one is he's presenting it not in a communist style, but really in an explicitly um, Western influence, you know, what we would identify as pop art, you know, very much referencing an artist like Andy Warhol or, or even with the Bende Dodds technique, a uh, Roy Lichtenstein too. Um, and, you know, that's just, the, this is to set the grounds that, you know, while the, in the Soviet Union or in places like uh, East Germany too, you know, there were really strict artistic circumstances where to be a professional artist, you largely had to produce works in the realist style and it had to be celebratory of things like labor heroes or Lenin, but, you know, in that realist style, but, you know, places like Hungary had different communist systems and, and really after the Hungarian revolution um, in, in the late 1950s where there, you know, there, it was uh, a big student uprising and there was a big crackdown uh, by Soviet tanks and there were thousands of deaths and tens of thousands of arrests. Uh, you know, their communist regime saw that in order to keep people satiated, to keep people from revolting again, they started to loosen up a lot of the restrictions in their communist society, and, and that extended to the art world. So by the time you get to the 1960s and 1970s, Hungary actually had a relatively much more open art world to operate in, and accordingly, you know, artists could bring in Western influences to their works or abstraction modernist forms, and they could present those works professionally in gallery spaces out in the open without fear of as much censorship or consequences. And that's very much different from that of, say, the Soviet Union, where uh, famously in the 1970s, they cracked down on unofficial art exhibitions with bulldozers and confiscated works of art at the same time. So very different circumstances uh, between those countries. Uh, just moving ahead, I'll, I'll point out in the center here, we have a couple of works that speaks uh, specifically on the idea of monuments. And I think this is uh, an element at the museum that's a really good vehicle for connecting, um, you know, connecting the Cold War time period to the 1990s and then connecting that to our contemporary times as well. 
the museum itself has a large collection of monuments from these former communist countries. And, you know, same as it was in the 1990s, as it is now, it's still very much an ongoing debate in these various countries, you know, to what degree do we preserve these material objects that at the time were, you know, vehicles of propaganda, were celebrations of these communist systems. But, you know, after the fall of state socialism, how do we treat these objects that so closely or intrinsically resemble or are objects of failed ideologies? Um, and, you, you know, you could easily connect that argument too to what's going on in the United States with the, the debates, especially on university campuses over Confederates, uh, Confederate monuments. Uh, you know, myself, I, I went to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, that, that there's been, you know, active protests and, and oppositional efforts for years, you know, stretching for five, six years over, over the presence of a, you know, Confederate adjacent monument on campus there. Um, even, you know, as ongoing in, in places like, uh, you know, Germany or, or maybe not so much in Russia, but places like Hungary and Poland, even them who throughout the 1990s and the 2000s and the 2010s have kind of fluctuated between these governments that, you know, some are maybe a bit more critical of that, you know, communist overseen past. And, and some of them are maybe more sympathetic, especially nowadays, places like Hungary and Poland, you know, have more governments that are, you know, are looking to really revert back to more uh, Cold War era styles of governments too, and and really that reflects in the in the debates about monuments and you know it's at its core it's you know some people or I guess on the ends of the spectrum on one end people are saying we need to save these objects these are to show people you know what life was like in the past and you know in a lot of cases how bad life was like in the past and how is, how else are young people really going to understand this if they can't see you know these objects that are so representative of that past but at the same time there's so much trauma and terrors associated with the lives lived and you know to think if you grew up in a place like like the Soviet Union and you escaped in the 1960s and 1970s you know you don't want to just be seeing objects like that that really trigger a lot of you know terror and emotion to that time just out in the public sphere as well so you know there's a lot I, I i talk to people at the museum all about it there's such a wide range of opinions on what people should do with monuments uh, but in this case uh, this is a monument uh, this one here this is a monument uh, from uh, latvia uh, uh, in the which was a, a Soviet Republic uh, that was uh, made in the 1950s. Uh, I'll zoom in a little bit. Uh, this is a, kind of a classic Lenin uh, style of monument. This is actually from a specific scene of of Lenin returning uh, from exile uh, from the Soviet Union. He was out of uh, the Soviet Union, um, I think, for over a decade uh, in Western Europe, and this was him returning. Uh, to Petrograd at the time and giving his first speech uh, in the train station after after a decade of exile. Um, and it's it's famous him pointing that you see a lot of monuments that are very much of that same style. But uh, this one stood in Latvia from the 1950s uh, until the early 2000s, uh, though Latvia was actually one of the first of the Soviet republics to declare its independence from the USSR in 1991. So they were actually one of the first uh, countries to start taking down their monuments, but it's been, you know, some countries did it very rapid, places like East Germany did things like, you know, destroy a lot of the monuments, but also destroyed a lot of the Berlin Wall itself uh, very quickly and turned that into pavement. Uh, but a lot of the countries still are, uh, have this mixture of some of them, you know, keep a lot of these relics up, even now with the invasion in Ukraine. Uh, I've seen news stories where Ukrainian soldiers are to this day, you know, themselves pulling down Soviet era monuments too, like, you know, as a message against Russia, you know, as a, as a comment on, on this idea of, you know, Soviet dominance as exhibited through monuments being erected in these various places outside of Russia itself. So, you know, very much an ongoing topic and, and certainly something I'm willing uh, to open up as, in the Q&A as well. Uh, the second section here, this is, um, Kind of showing that at times there are big gaps in information um, 
as far as like our own understanding and historians understanding of works coming from these various countries. Like, of course, you know, a lot of the documentation of these works uh, in the Soviet Union did a lot of times didn't make it out of the Soviet period or, or were classified documents or, you know, we're just not very transparent in these archives. And, and especially too, when you're dealing with, um, I don't know, when you're dealing with like uh, art in the official style, uh, like something like these two here, let me can I zoom out a little bit. Uh, let's start with this one here first. So, um, you know, something like this one here, uh, this is a work that, you know, has, again, these kind of classical styles of official Soviet work. There was lots of portraits of agricultural workers. Uh, same thing with this one on the right with these three women uh, standing in this field. You know, it was meant to be sort of this celebration of, of, of the workers who were growing the food, who were feeding the country. But at the same time, especially when some of the styles sort of deviate from especially that classical realist style, like this one here is maybe a bit more impressionistic, but also something like this one I think is perhaps a little more open to interpretation because, um, you know, as far as like perspective of the work and just the way the three figures in this field are presented, whereas this one on the right, this is a rather realist style. This man, it's kind of clear to know, we can judge by his wristwatch, like he has a gold wristwatch here that was, given specifically to labor heroes. So this guy would have been some sort of exalted agricultural worker uh, celebrated in that way. But, you know, comparing it to this one here, this one's a little more odd, like relative to the figures in the back of the field. It's, you know, maybe you could give credit to the artist saying that this is actually supposed to be a bit of an absurd painting. Like maybe, you know, given that these women take up the entire canvas, maybe, the artist is trying to present something perhaps maybe a bit more mythological uh, or maybe a little more something unreal. Uh, there's other examples of that too, like beside it here. This is another one uh, where, you know, this is women again a wor working in this field, but this is not in a realist style. Uh, this one's actually from Hungary as well, but, you know, it's not entirely clear, you know, how much to read into, you know, the faces on these women, like, are they presenting some sort of malaise or discontent or, you know, their bodies are sort of presented in this contorted way. So we, you know, we don't know if this is just the artist's own style, but applying it to, you know, celebratory worker portraits, but, or if they're, you know, laying some deeper message or how far to go in the interpretation without extra information about the artist, which oftentimes is not is not too available. Um, also show, you know, they're in in places like Hungary, again, there was a fine line between what, you know, official and unofficial work. So uh, I'll show these three ceramic works here. Uh, these were all produced at the same uh, state run ceramics factory, which was called the Zolzne factory, uh, which is uh, in Hungary, it still exists to this day. Uh, they were particularly known for uh, this green uh, glazing process that you see on this front one. Uh, it's, it's kind of a green reflective uh, process. Uh, it's a little distorted in this image, but um, uh, you can see an example of that in the Lenin bus or the Lenin display at the beginning. Uh, but what's fascinating about this one is that even though this was the same state-run ceramics factory, they were producing both very ideologically communist works, like this one uh, on the left of the screen here, which is, you know, very much comrades in arms, you know, with gun in hand, you know, you can't really separate that from the communist ideology. But at the same time, this factory was producing uh, these works that were very abstract in form and in subject matter. Uh, in this case, the one in green, this one is called Lovers, or, or sorry, sorry, the first one in the foreground is actually called Mother and Child. Uh, so it's meant to represent uh, a mother and a young child. And then this red one, in the back is, is called lovers. So it's depicting just these, these two people in arms. But obviously these are very stylistically different. Um, and you know, I think at first glance, this may be more resembles something you expect from a quote unquote Western artist, of course, with its use of abstraction and not necessarily something you would associate with being produced in a communist country, but uh, you know, showing 
that in a place like Hungary, there was more of a gray zone or more of a room to operate in between those two ends of the spectrum between, uh, you know, realist art and abstract art. And, you know, in some circumstances, they, they did exist uh, in, in the same uh, ecosystem, the same artistic ecosystem. Um, I'll show another Hungarian art uh, artwork. This is from the late 1980s. Uh, this whole section, and I'll show another example from this one. This is, uh, again, playing with that curatorial presentation information. So you can actually see uh, this work has a placard on either side. Um, so the idea is that each of these works in this section uh, have two separate descriptions, e each of them rooted in fact, but also at the same time sort of contradicting each other. So uh, it's all about how our understanding of not only art, but history in general is very much dependent on what are your sources of information and, and what are their own biases in presenting that information? Again, a very relevant topic in the here and now. So uh, this in this work, for example, obviously this artist uh, screen printed this work and they use two very seemingly different um, symbologies, uh, you know, on one end of the spectrum in the center, the communist red star, you know, something again, intrinsically associated with with you know the, the quote unquote East and with communism and and something that would be on the worldwide stage identifiable identifiable as a as a communist symbol um, and on the other end of the spectrum the the artist many times overlaid the Coca Cola logo you know of course being representative of the quote unquote West capitalism democracy and all that comes with it and and Coca Cola of course very symbolically starting to appear in a lot of these former communist countries. In the uh, you know during the era of perestroika, the mid to late nineteen eighties and onwards, and and sort of the spreading or rather you know this cross cultural exchange through things like Coca Cola or you know McDonald's, you know all these American brands that ended up uh, showing up in these communist countries in the late nineteen eighties. But as far as interpretation, you know uh, we're, we're presenting that you know on one hand these could be understood as seemingly very different, very different symbologies, but, you know, it could also be interpreted that the artist is looking to say that, you know, while these are seemingly very opposite concepts, you know, at their root, uh, you know, Coca-Cola and, you know, communist systems use things like symbols and colors, you know, to unite people and really at the end of the day to sell people on a product, you know, regardless of if that product is you know, a, a way of life, a, a system of governance, you know, that they believe works best for people, or or if they're selling you on, on a soda, at the end of the day, you know, it's it's advertising, it's marketing, it's it's you know, uniting people with with common with common symbols and colors and and and, and yeah, and images in that way too. So uh, that one's kind of showing it's kind of two more different interpretations. But some of these are more showing like uh, the gap really, and especially the gap in, let's say, projection versus reality. And I think especially with Soviet art and, and a lot of the communist art that was being used as propaganda, you know, it was called socialist realist art. That was the style, but it comes off almost as an oxymoron because realist is referring just to the painting style. But it wasn't so real in content oftentimes. And, and really a lot of these paintings are noted as being very heavy distortions of reality or, or what life was like in these times. You know, many people were suffering in these countries during these time periods, but the, the paintings make them look like flourishing societies. And, and that was very much an intentional tool of propaganda in a lot of places like the Soviet Union. So, you know, an example of this work here, uh, this is one from the 1970s. This one's called Growing Wheat, uh, the Airdrop. Um, so this was done by a Soviet artist in the mid 1970s. Um, on the idea with the two placards here is this one is on one hand presenting it as as you know the Soviet artist, what, you know, explaining what what this is exalting. So this is sort of a classic labor hero portrait where oftentimes the the hero is one front and center in the painting and 
this guy, sometimes I joke that they oftentimes like have their hand on their hip and their chest pumped out like a like Superman. This guy literally has his hand on his hip and his chest pumped out. Uh, it's very clear who the labor hero is in this work. Uh, it's his pilot here. Uh, so this is setting a scene where, you know, the pilot is picking up these bundles of wheat um, and he's going to be transporting this wheat to feed the Soviet populations in mass. Um, but, you know, in sharing this gap between projection and reality, um, actually in the mid 1970s, the Soviet Union was having a major wheat shortage um, in the country due, due to uh, weather issues. And uh, they actually had such a shortage and it was such a problem that they quite infamously uh, imported wheat from the United States in the 1970s uh, to help, help cover that gap uh, of wheat growth and, and to prevent uh, larger famine uh, across the block uh, at the time. So, you know, it's actually a bit ironic that, uh, you know, they were presenting this image of great wheat yields and prosperity and this labor hero, uh, because at the time it was actually predict particularly uh, dire needs for, for enhanced wheat supply uh, within the Soviet Union. So, uh, so maybe it's a bit of a tell that this is what they were relying on uh, when, at the uh, when at the time actually quite the opposite was going on. Uh, with this major shortage. Um, towards the back, I'm just going to point out two works because I do want to make sure to have some time on the back end, both for our second exhibition and also for the Q&A. Uh, so uh, back here, I'll show uh, this is uh, actually this whole section, if you want to go back and explore it, for those who are into philosophy, uh, this section entirely is called theory. Uh, so the idea which each of these works uh, is that uh, each of the sections are accompanied by a notable philosopher. Uh, in this case, uh, this is works interpreted through the concepts of Nietzsche. Um, so the idea is that each of the works uh, sort of have their interpretation aligned with a concept of a historical thinker or a philosopher and to you know, interpret that work, you know, through these various historical theories. Uh, so uh, for people who are more into theory and philosophy, uh, you might want to revisit this section as I share the link at the end. Uh, let me back up a bit so you can see both of these works at the same time, because uh, these works are interesting because uh, they very much appear to be the same painting in their entirety. Uh, they, the original one was actually painted in 1949. Uh, so these are some of the earlier works in the show. Uh, but what's fascinating about this work, if you take a look at them a little bit closer, there's one major omission from the one on the right to the one on the left, uh, which is uh, this original one on the right, uh, very prominently in this top right corner, has a bust of uh, Stalin uh, overseeing the proceedings. Like I said, this one's from 1949, so this would have been very much during the period of, of Stalin's rule. Uh, he was uh, head of the Soviet Union until 1953. Uh, when he died, uh, died. Uh, but in this case, this is a painting called uh, Ceremony for the Komsomol, uh, which was a Soviet youth organization, sort of a compulsory uh, militarized scouts type organization. Um, but in this case, this original painting, you know, very much an official work, they're very much being celebratory of this, you know, state run youth organization and this young girl's induction into the ceremony. Uh, but you know, Stalin is very intentionally placed in this corner, almost if it, as if he's he himself is sitting in the room. Um, and, you know, he's looking over at the girl like he's giving his blessings to the proceedings. But, you know, like a lot of Soviet paintings at the time, this one was probably mass produced many times over uh, these very ideological works. Uh, so this is a repainting of it that was done after 1953, after Stalin's death. Um, and this is very indicative of the period after Stalin died, which uh, historians oftentimes refer to as the Khrushchev Thaw, uh, which was this period where in 1956, uh, Nikita Khrushchev assumes the leadership of the Soviet Union, and within a couple of years, starts to in, first internally acknowledge a lot of the horrors of, of the Stalinist regime and of, of the great purges of the 1930s, where there were hundreds of thousands to potentially millions of, of deaths on behalf of Stalin, you know, looking to really uh, purge the ranks and, and really, um, you know, establish his power and root out anybody who might be oppositional to his power. When Khrushchev took power, 
he, you know, not only acknowledged a lot of those terrors, but also started to release a lot of the political prisoners uh, who were locked up during the Stalinist times. So accordingly, uh, in society, there was a lot more of a critical eye towards the legacy of Stalin at that time because, uh, because people were starting to come to understand a bit more of, of really the scale of, of what he committed. That's not to say they gave them all the information, like at all, um, but really, at least internally, there was a lot less of uh, wanting to build a Stalinist style of society. And, and it really looked back to more of a Leninist Marxist style of communism, because Stalinism especially was noticed, noted for its large scale of violence. And, and you know, of course, violence to some degree did continue on from the 1950s onwards. Uh, but really, they, they were a bit honest with themselves of, of really, you know, how bad the actions of Stalin were and really what the scale of it were. So, uh, you know, that's reflected in the art. Uh, you don't see, you know, this style putting like a ghost Stalin in the work, like that type of thing didn't really extend that much more uh, beyond his death in 1953. So you do see, uh, start to see a big change in the Soviet art world uh, with him appearing less. And then also, um, you know, definitely restrictions on artistic expression, you know, if something was politically neutral, uh, there was less of a propensity to censor it uh, from the 1950s onwards after Stalin's death. Um, also point out, uh, this will be the last one for this show, but uh, this is another fascinating work that has also been manipulated after its original creation. So uh, moving ahead to that next era in the Soviet Union, this was a painting from 1958 of Nikita Khrushchev addressing Russian parliament. Um, you know, again, this would have been an official work that was produced at the time to celebrate Nikita Khrushchev, who uh, was the leader in the Soviet Union from 1956 to 1964. Um, what's fascinating or what stands out about this work is, like I said, this has been manipulated in a way and in a very particular way, uh, which is in this very official portrait where Nikita Khrushchev is the very central figure of the work. Uh, yet at the same time, it's been scratched out. Um, very curiously uh, from this painting. And um, in the case of him in, in kind of the history element too, he actually, uh, as they got into the early 1960s, he actually was kind of falling out of favor with his party and, and with the population as a whole. And, and he really lost his role in the Soviet government because he was more or less cooed um, by, by a couple of high ranking Soviet officials, uh, probably most recognizably uh, Brezhnev, uh, who you can actually see uh, sitting right here, just up above uh, Khrushchev's shoulder. Uh, but um, so Nikita Khrushchev falling out of power, or sorry, falling out of favor with the party, you know, his legacy wouldn't have been too revered afterwards. So we don't know exactly when this was scratched off. And we actually brought in the Getty Conservation Institute to study this painting, because it's it's kind of odd that you can actually see the, uh, you can see the, uh, like the bench behind them. And it's it's kind of curious. And they, the, Getty actually wasn't able to put their finger on it, but they assume it may have been scratched off and then repainted over and then painted with him back over and then also having that layer scratched off again. So it's some some type of curiosity as to how this would have actually been pulled off or for what, for what reason at the time. But, you know, I think especially in the context of the now where, you know, a lot of the you know, a lot of the justification in Russia right now for the invasion of Ukraine is this idea of like revisionist history or, or really distorting historical facts to tell, especially the stories of Soviet times. You know, Putin is saying places like Ukraine, like he's saying Ukraine was created by Lenin, you know, in the early 20th century. And this idea that historical facts can be rewritten and oftentimes historians themselves rely on material objects and records and sometimes artworks to understand the actual facts of history. But at the same time, you know, oftentimes things like art or, you know, art can be manipulated, material objects can be destroyed, records can be destroyed, can be altered. Uh, so I think especially by looking or studying history through the lens of art, uh, there's certainly circumstances where there's been efforts to manipulate you know, what is left behind for future generations to understand about the, the factual uh, happenings of the past uh, could, be, could be a good way to put it. 
Um, I'll jump ahead because I do want to leave plenty of time for the Q&A. Uh, then I've also talked a long time. And I'll, I'll be sure to share this link. So you can, uh, as you can see too, each of these works have uh, sort of uh, bubbles beside them. So if you really want to dig in and if you're really interested in the museum, you, re you can really go work by work and uh, better understand uh, the more biographical information that we have on display. Um, let me just uh, jump into this one. Uh, so this is a, a show called Soviet Jewish Life uh, that has two core key components. This is a, um, I'll start with these photographs here. Uh, so this is a two-part uh, show, uh, the first of which contains photographs by a Los Angeles-based uh, photographer named Bill Aaron, uh, who traveled or, or really had a trip that was funded by the Israeli consulate of Los Angeles in 1981 to travel to various cities in, these, or in uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, so he traveled to Moscow and Leningrad and Minsk um, and traveled not only to various synagogues um, in those cities, but also to private homes of uh, what at the time were called Soviet refuseniks. Um, and I can explain a little of what uh, Soviet refuseniks mean. Uh, but more or less, uh, this was a, a trip, uh, a mission trip in order to capture photographs of Soviet Jewish people uh, who at the time were a part of this larger international human rights campaign that really kicked off in the 1960s uh, to advocate for free exit from the Soviet Union so that they could live freely as Jewish people elsewhere in the world. Because, you know, really in the Soviet Union, after, say, the 1940s, um, you know, they really formalized their laws and their society to really be an anti-Semitic society. It was not, you know, there were many, many discri uh, discriminations that came along with being openly Jewish in the Soviet Union. Um, you know, a lot of high-ranking jobs were very, only had a very limited number that were available to Jewish people. Uh, university admissions, same thing. Um, you know, not to mention just like person-to-person -person social discriminations. Um, and to be Jewish, we actually have a, we have a very clear example of this. Um, up top here in the gallery space too, we actually have uh, the other artist that's featured here, his actual birth certificate from the Soviet Union. Um, and this points out too, you don't need to read Russian, but um, in this line here and this line here, it's outlined that his mother and father's ethnicity is Jewish. So, you know, in the Soviet Union, which was, explicitly in atheist society. They, you know, they didn't believe in religion. Uh, they viewed Judaism very much as an ethnicity and as a part of the discrimination against Jewish people, it was on your birth certificate, on your passport, it would list that you were Jewish. Like, you know, you couldn't escape it in, in life as a Jewish person in, in Soviet society. And there were so many discriminations that came along with it. Um, so, in the 1960s and beyond, uh, there was a movement called the Refusenik Movement that really started with uh, the hijacking of a plane by a group of 12 Soviet, uh, Soviet Jews uh, who were looking to escape to Israel at the time. So they, they, um, they hijacked a plane, uh, but their, uh, their attempt was actually uh, broken up. It wasn't a successful attempt, uh, but they were put on trial in the Soviet Union very, there was a big media event and it got the attention of the international community. But really that, that show trial or that trial uh, really showed a light on the plight of Soviet Jewish people at the time. And, and really, especially in the American Jewish community to really see that, you know, a lot of these people who maybe a generation or two, you know, they themselves, their families came from these parts of the world. You know, they were seeing that their, their families that were left behind, their ancestors, their communities were really, you know, being, not being able to live fully as Jewish people without being under heavy surveillance um, and not being able to live fully Jewish lives. So um, if, after that event, there was, you know, really a mass application for people, for Jewish people to leave the Soviet Union. And accordingly, the Soviet Union systematically blocked the free exit of Jewish people from leaving the Soviet Union in the 1960s through the 1980s. So that sparked off a larger movement in the United States called the Soviet Jewry Movement, uh, which some of you might be familiar with. Uh, that was 
you know, that played out in activist rallies, especially in Los Angeles and New York City, sometimes numbering in the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. Um, and, uh, you know, that was a lot of advocacy, but also in the Soviet Union, it sparked uh, an interest in the her Jewish heritage of a lot of these people who knew they were Jewish, but they didn't know what it meant to be Jewish. They, you know, they, it was really only the gen older generations I can show. Uh, it was really the older generations who had familiarity with the practices of being Jewish. So accordingly, in a lot of these uh, synagogue photographs taken in 1981, it was, mo uh, again, mo mo mainly older Jewish people. Uh, this is uh, a home with a, let me zoom in a bit more on it. Uh, so this is uh, what was a private home in um, in Minsk, um, and this was a synagogue. Um, and then uh, so I, my, I'm not Jewish, but a Sukkot, the uh, the uh, structure uh, for Sukkot uh, constructed on the outside here. And then also here, this is a matzah baking oven, uh, which itself was something that, uh, for example, the KGB would go to Jewish homes and or Jewish organizations and synagogues and and like hassle them and sometimes dismantle things like matzah baking ovens, you know, these very simple uh, things that otherwise wouldn't be a threat at all. But uh, there was really a lot of hassling on behalf of the KGB. Um, again, these are some more scenes within synagogues. Uh, this one being uh, in uh, Moscow, uh, very ornate synagogues. But again, really, there were only a handful of synagogues in these very large cities, uh, many, many more than that than could accommodate uh, the, the Jewish populations. Uh, in those various cities at the time. But uh, these photographs traveled throughout the United States in the 1980s uh, as an exhibition themselves called uh, By Spirit Alone. Uh, so that was the whole point was Bill traveled to capture these photographs and then use them to aid this larger Soviet Jewry movement in the United States and to really show people, you know, what the situation was like for Soviet Jewish people uh, at the time. Um, and then in this exhibition, uh, there's a lot more to explore, but uh, I'll just briefly introduce, there are, I'll go to this one here. Um, there's a series of works uh, done by a, uh, he was actually Soviet born, but he's uh, based in New York City now, uh, by an artist named Yevgeny Fix, uh, who does a, has a series of works on what's called the Jewish Autonomous Region of the Soviet Union, uh, which also is referred to as Bureau Bajon, uh, which was the name of its capital city. Uh, but this was a designated autonomous Jewish homeland that was established on the border of Russia and China in 1934. So this is even before Israel. Um, and this was a Soviet project to establish a, a homeland in the Soviet Union for Jewish people. Um, and it, it's very interesting in that um, one, uh, its official language was actually that of Yiddish. Uh, so it's the only place in the world that has ever had Yiddish as its official language. Um, and this was part of this progressive Jewish movement in the early 20th century to establish Yiddish as, you know, not only a language of the household, but really as, you know, a cultural language. It was, you know, there was Yiddish theater in the Soviet Union, in Moscow and, you know, St. Petersburg and, and also in, in this place, Bureau Bajan, uh, but also as a literary language for magazines and books. Uh, so, you know, pre-World War II, of course, you know, the Yiddish language more or less, you know, became extinct after World War II and the Holocaust and, and all that came along with that. But before that, there was an effort to build up these Jewish communities that were strictly Yiddish speaking. Um, and also this was a project that was, you know, during the time of Stalin, but was also very much supported by those progressive Jewish communities. And, you know, looking at earlier Soviet history, Actually, a lot of the early Bolsheviks themselves were Jewish. Uh, probably most prominently, uh, Leon Trotsky uh, was, was Jewish himself. And, and really, part of the story of the early Soviet Union was this alliance between the Bolsheviks and Soviet Jewish people who had a common goal, which was to overthrow the old system that wasn't working for either of them. Jewish people were relegated to, you know, I, I, a plot of land called the Pale of Settlement. There was a there was a single chunk of land that only Jewish people could live in, and where they were kept out of Russia essentially for hundreds of years under this imperial, you know, under this uh, system of kings. So 
you know, they group, they partnered with the Bolsheviks and a lot of those early revolutionaries were Jewish themselves. And, you know, there was a promise in the early Soviet Union that, you know, groups like Jewish people would be given autonomy to build a system, you know, to build societies, to build cities, all their own that were Jewish specifically. Um, that all really changes with the late 1930s, uh, with the Stalin, Stalinist purges, where, you know, he's starting to uh, root out uh, leaders within the Soviet government, many of them Jewish themselves. Almost all Jewish leaders were, were purged uh, in the mid to late 1930s. Um, also with the Soviet Union aligned with Nazi Germany, with the non-aggression pact in the late 1930s, you know, show, you know, as a part of that agreement, showing that, you know, that they had, you know, to agree with these views towards Jewish people in the Soviet Union. And then after the war as well, uh, you know, there's, there's all types of stories about it, but really Stalin, with the establishment of Israel, gets very paranoid that Jewish people in the Soviet Union could not be loyal to the USSR, to the motherland, because they intrinsically have joint loyalty with Israel as well, that Jewish people are disloyal because Israel exists. Uh, so um, there's this whole history with the project. And, and again, I'm running short on time, so I can't introduce it too much. But there's a whole series of artworks where basically this artist comments not only on the specific history of this area of Bureau Bajan, uh, but also on specifically its natural features, this idea of building a new homeland and building connections between the people who were moving there, of which at its peak had 40 or so thousand uh, Jewish people who are living in this region on the border of Russia and China, uh, but also focusing on things like the forests and the bodies of water, and in this case, like the plants and animals that these Jewish people were essentially having to create a new mythology around that tied you know, their Jewish history, uh, but, you know, creating a mythology or creating these connections from scratch as they constructed this essentially homeland from nothing and trying to build it from some to something in the 1930s and 1940s. Um, but with that, I see it's uh, three tells, so I definitely uh, want to open up some questions. I can even start, uh, I see there was a question or two in the chat, and I, and I can certainly jump uh, back to the tour as well, if there's something specific to see. Um, I see, uh, I'm just going to answer the first one. It seems that Russia adheres to the policy of questionable history as it relates to the horrible situation in Ukraine. Does the museum have a plan for an exhibition for resistance to Russian domination in the 21st century? Um, we definitely do. I would say for exhibitions, we do plan our exhibitions about every three to four years out in advance. So uh, we actually have ex our real exhibitions planned out right now through, I believe, 2025. Uh, but we do, uh, through our public programming, I think that's where we do fill in a lot of the more uh, relevant and, and contemporary topics. Uh, so, uh, for example, we, we've done a number of series uh, in partnership with other organizations as well, and we're bringing in academics and, and key historians uh, from across the world in our live public programs. Uh, we do those uh, we used to do them every week, actually, for about a year and a half. We had a live uh, weekly Zoom program at noon where we explored a different topic, and they're quite popular. If you want to check uh, check out our virtual programming, you can find that on our website. Uh, we have done a number of virtual programs on that subject, uh, but perhaps most interesting, we actually have a student-led uh, virtual program that we do monthly now called In Search of Truth. Uh, so it's all about examining the concept of truth in our modern day and very much, you know, speaking on, uh, you know, things that are happening in Russia as well as in the United States as well. Uh, just this past week, we brought in a former ambassador to Germany um, and a major human rights uh, activist for the United States government for a number of decades. Uh, who's, and these are high schoolers and university students, and it's a, a very nice roundtable discussion. Uh, I would definitely recommend checking that one out. We do that uh, at the end of every month. Uh, but certainly, yeah, our public programming and, and our virtual programming, we, we try to fill in that gap. Uh, our, our current exhibitions, like I say, are, are pretty far planned in advance, uh, too. Um, are we okay on time? Is it okay if I answer? Yeah, you can you can take as much time as you want. Okay, cool. I just want to make sure I wasn't holding anything up. Um, the, the next question is, uh, how did the Venom Museum acquire these monuments, art pieces, pieces and statues? So. Um, it's a long, nuanced history. Um, it's it's also very quite varied. Uh, when the museum was 
first getting started, our founder was actually only like 22 years old. Um, so he did his undergraduate studies at UCLA in history. Uh, this was in the late 1990s. Um, and then in the early 2000s, he was studying at Oxford to get his PhD, uh, specifically looking at symbologies in former communist countries during this time period. Um, and uh, specifically, he started traveling in the early 2000s to places like Berlin and going to flea markets and auctions and, 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 and starting to get objects just for his own university research, for his own PhD research. Um, and at the time, there was very little placed on art and objects from that time period. They could be acquired for very, very, very cheap, especially in a place like Germany uh, that, you know, very much politicizes that history of East Germany and, and especially something like art. If it's communist art, you know, no one would put that up in a museum. You know, that's viewed as propaganda and therefore not artistic and therefore, you know, it's it's trash in a lot of ways. That's that's how a lot of people view it there. So, uh, so the museum, he started acquiring objects for that purpose, but, you know, he found his, uh, his PhD advisor let him know that, you know, when writing these papers and doing this research, you can't just cite objects that are in your closet. You know, you can't uh, just say, this is something I bought at a flea market. You have, it has to be a part of the institution. So, uh, so when he was at doing his PhD, he established the Venda Museum as a way to, you know, house this initial small collection of objects and to be able to use them as, as citations in his research. And, and really when he wrapped up his studies, uh, he looked initially to pass off this collection to European institutions. But again, at the time, there really wasn't uh, a value placed on these objects because it, it was the relatively recent past. It wasn't viewed as history. It wasn't viewed as significant. So, uh, so with that, he took the objects back to the United States in a shipping crate. I don't know how many he had at the time, probably not more than a thousand. And, um, and basically, he was able to acquire uh, funding from a former, uh, from a UCLA, his his UCLA history professor, whose name is Peter Baldwin, uh, who has a, a foundation. Oh, actually, y'all are UCLA. You might know Peter Baldwin. Um, but uh, basically, Peter Baldwin has this, uh, Peter uh, Baldwin uh, and Lisbeth, I, I forget her last name, uh, Lisbeth, they have this foundation uh, called the Arcadia Fund, uh, which basically funds organizations that work to preserve endangered material cultures and histories. So, um, so that was our big initial funder. Um, and with that funding from, from Peter Baldwin, we were able to expand the acquisition efforts of the museum uh, to various areas and, and countries and, and you know, art, and but also things like children's toys and food menus, but also like military uniforms and KGB materials. And, and really, you know, we're in our 20th year of existence. Um, for our first 15 years, we really existed more in a storage warehouse space that was more just for the collection. And we only had a very small exhibition space. So it was more of an emphasis on the historical collection and bringing in outside researchers to, to activate our, our collection for their research. But it's really been just within the last five years with having this new armory building space with all this gallery, all these galleries that we can now, you know, experiment with, you know, still exploring history and still presenting some of our objects, but really using art as that language to, to really get to the center of the history and to presenting it in a way uh, that, you know, can be more understood by the general public. Are, are your displays exclusively from the collection or do you also take uh, pro offered objects? That's a good question. We, uh, I would say primarily, especially what you saw there, that's entirely from our own collection. Uh, but uh, for example, uh, with forthcoming exhibitions where, um, you know, maybe we don't have as much representation in our own collection. Uh, for example, the next exhibition that uh, we, we've actually changed up our exhibitions. That's the one you saw. So uh, I can introduce those uh, too. But uh, the one we have coming up in the fall is going to be focused on China uh, during the period of the Cultural Revolution. So that's going to be 1966 to 1976. Um, and that's, a, that's an area of the museum that we didn't have a huge uh, swath of objects represented from currently. So 
for that one, for example, we've both been acquiring new objects, but we're also getting uh, loans from a number of institutions, uh, not only locally, but internationally as well. Uh, so that will be uh, kind of deviating from how we typically display, which is largely our own stuff. Though so actually, uh, the exhibition when I first started uh, two rotations ago, uh, we had a traveling show, which was also a rarity, uh, which was radical women artists from all across the Eastern Bloc. Um, and that was a show that originally displayed at the Albertinium um, in Leipzig, Germany. Um, and we had that come over. So that was actually entirely uh, either from the artist's own collection or from other uh, museum institutions too. So uh, it varies, but I would say dominantly is, is our own collection just because uh, we have quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, I think it was really interesting um, that art that was um, redone or kind of scraped off. It reminded mm -hmm. me of the movie called The Lost Leonardo. I don't know oh, if anyone's that. seen that. So yeah. there, if you look up online, the Leonardo, the lost, the lost Leonardo, there is this whole thing about this piece of art that was supposedly done by Leonardo da Vinci, but the art curator decided to fix it and kind of change the whole um, picture itself. So it's really a, a great movie. I think it was probably on Netflix or something, but that is really interesting. So, um, see, are there any other questions? Um, you have the option to go sure, ahead and yes. unmute yourself. We, we do have one more, at least in the chat. Oh. Um, oh, Zyma school offers, uh, offering school tours. So yes, are you doing is. actually in-person tours at the moment? Yes, yeah, so we've, we've been able to host schools back probably since last fall. Uh, that's actually probably the bulk of my job. So I'm, I'm the education manager at the museum. So in addition to training other staff to give tours and leading the public tours myself, a big part of it is bringing school groups in. Um, and I think, I, I think just kind of in explaining what we do with school groups too, talking about using art as a way to share information, maybe in a way that's more easily digestible, especially for young people who have maybe never even heard of the Soviet Union or don't even know what the Cold War is, you know, right from the start. They don't really teach that oftentimes to like high school level. Um, so uh, a lot of what we do at the museum is try to present art activities that share uh, some angles of history uh, when school groups do visit. Generally, we welcome middle school through university level uh, we probably get the most interest from uh, from college groups, I would say, but uh, we have been able to host uh, fifth as low as fifth grade. Uh, but I'll, I'll share an example of a really a project I, I designed last year that I'm really happy with um, was one where we uh, adapted propaganda poster designs from our own collection. Uh, but we had an artist um, edit the designs to remove uh, the original language on them or to remove the Russian language and to remove the original context and really just believe the visual uh, language of propaganda posters as a template. And then we, we put them on screens. Uh, so uh, basically we have these different uh, screen printing templates that we've inviting been inviting students to print these propaganda posters, but then to stencil on their own messages to an outside world, you know, uh, essentially turning propaganda on its head and giving power to the individual uh, to speak on changes they want to see in the world uh, to create a better tomorrow. But, uh, but you know, so at the same time, introducing these concepts of, you know, what is propaganda? How was it used then? You know, what might be some things you see in the world nowadays that, you know, some people call propaganda or, you know, again, looking at what are your sources of information, you know, comparing how back then, you know, propaganda was so effective because people only had one, one source of information and that, and that was the, the authority's voice. Uh, so, you know, trying to show to young people how, how powerful information was and how it was, you know, used in a very, you know, sometimes twisted way back then and even in our modern times, but also looking at all of the different sources of information now and, and starting to think more critically about that as well. So, you know, I think that's an example of, you know, it's good because not all times students want to just put their hands in their pocket and listen to a tour for an hour. I think really when they can get their hands busy and start applying it, uh, to making things that that's where we have our most effective student visits. But uh, yeah, we, we welcome school groups probably uh, every other week or so. Uh, that's not too uncommon. 
That's very cool. And thank you, Aisha, for uh, posting the Lost Leonardo information as well as the Vonda Museum's website uh, and the virtual tour in the chat. So if you haven't seen that, anybody who's still online can check that out. Uh, any other questions that we want to ask Michael about? Yeah, feel free to go ahead and unmute yourself and then we can um, have an open discussion as long as mm -hmm. one of the Michaels is still here. <laughs> Okay, no further no. questions. That is okay. Oh, one thing I did want to mention that, uh, that you didn't include with the review of the museum is that they also have a textile uh, archive. That, oh uh, yeah, if, if that's particularly interesting, anybody, we, we do have some examples of that uh, on our online collection on the website. Uh, but we have, we, have a, we have a pretty extensive collection of um, yeah, fabric samples. There, there was a big textile manufacturer called Hungaritex, uh, who was a, a major textile manufacturer for Eastern Bloc countries. And we have thousands and thousands of very, very interesting uh, textile patterns. And, and also, if, if people are just interested in like how those were applied, we also have a large archive of like fashion magazines and, and also like catalogs and things like that uh, from those various countries. Those are also on our online uh, collection if uh, that's one of our larger collections that people might be interested in. I just wanted to make mention of that because it, it uh, I know you have a preservation room and spaces like that as well in the same building in the, the former armory. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's along with, yeah, we have a textile lab and that's also where we store a lot of our posters. So that's more like flat file. Uh, we also have specialized facilities for our film reels. So we have an entire film freezer where we have hundreds and hundreds of educational films, worker instructional films, speeches, children's cartoons, propaganda films. Um, all of those we're, we're working with the digitization team uh, to both you know, archive them, but also to make those available for free and make them available to the public on our website uh, when that's done. So that's a multi-year project, but at the end of the day, we're looking to make our entire collection fully transparent and acceptable uh, to anybody who's interested, not only scholars, but just the general public who wants to learn a thing or two. Very cool. And, um, and, I'll, and, mm -hmm. oh, and I'll just add to just to uh, emphasize if anybody wants to visit the museum in person, uh, like I said, we have, we have two new exhibitions on display. Uh, we are open to the public on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays uh, from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, you don't have to make a reservation in advance. Um, and currently we have two shows, uh, one that has an exhibit of flags and banners uh, from 10 different uh, former communist countries. Uh, there's about 30 different examples that are hanging in the rafters. And then along the walls, uh, we have uh, both contemporary art and historic art, all of which uses flags or banners as either a medium or, or a media or a central core message or motif of the work. So it's all about flags. Um, and then the back show is a really cool photography show that is both indoors and outdoors. And basically someone traveled to former military sites and underground bunkers in both the East and the West and sort of documents these places that were largely abandoned in the 1990s and haven't really been touched since. It's kind of spooky. Uh, but, um, but if anybody's interested in seeing those, uh, definitely check us out on a weekend, no advanced registration required. Um, and and if you can even tap me on the shoulder if you see me and I'll give you a, a brief tour as well. So the museum is free and so is the parking. Yes, it's a big to, parking lot. Yeah, it's it's just down the crossroads of Overland Avenue and Culver Boulevard. Absolutely. It's the best part about this not being in Los Angeles is the free parking. Um, <laughs> well, thank you so much, Michaels. Um, I will put this on our YouTube channel once it's finished uploading and I'll send out some information about how to find the museum. I really think if everyone has not seen The Lost Leonardo, it's a fantastic movie. Um, check that one out and um, I'll put uh, Michael's information and uh, the, um, the virtual tour in the follow-up email. So thank you all for coming. If there's no further questions, I'll let you have back your Wednesday um, and that's it. Michael, our, anything else? Just our That's grateful true. thanks to Michael Baldod Garza. Thank you so much for your information. And you are a wizard at this, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, thanks for having me. It was, a, it was a lot of fun to talk to you. And Nancy Barrett for doing all the legwork on it. Thank, yeah, thank you very you, much, Nancy. Michael, have yourself a great day and keep safe. I appreciate y'all. Bye. Bye. Thank you.